So while you were in Yemen, you spent a lot of time with um, Anwar Alaki, and we think uh, we definitely think that's an important story to get out. We recently spoke with Robert Gibbs and Peter King. They pretty much just said Alaki should have been killed if his kid was with him. That's the breaks. I would suggest that you uh, should have a far more responsible father if they're uh, truly concerned about the well-being of their children. This story, what would it mean if the you know if more people knew about it? What does that mean uh, for their perception in America's role in the world? I, I watched the interview that you. Guys guys did with uh, with Robert Gibbs and I, I've heard Peter King talk about this before um, Robert Gibbs should be ashamed of himself uh, for what he said um, he basically told you and and fortunately it was shown around the world uh, that the crime that this 16 year old American citizen had committed was having uh, a father who the United States government uh, secretly ordered assassinated without trial or without indictment the idea that you would have someone that just a few years ago was the public face of the administration almost gleefully uh, react to your question uh, about the killing of a, of a U.S. citizen um, in a targeted assassination operation, I think it's disgraceful. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that um, Abdul Rahman al was a normal 16-year-old boy who hadn't seen his father since May of 2009. He had a Facebook page. He had an unruly haircut that his grandfather was constantly telling him to do something about. He liked hip hop music. He, he was he was the just the antithesis of a terrorist or a terror suspect. And and the U.S. government has never been able to identify who they were targeting in that strike. The man they initially tried to say that was the target, Ibrahim Albana, was not there and is still alive. Uh, and 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 this is an absolute crime that this government has not produced a single word of explanation except for Robert Gibbs' shameful blaming of Anwar, of Abdul Rahman al death on his lineage. I mean, it, it's shocking to, to me uh, on one level. On another level, it makes perfect sense because the, these, these people are drunk with power and they've been deciding in a secret process who's going to live and die every Tuesday uh, for God knows how many years now. Um, and, and so, you know, it, 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 it to me is indicative of um, uh, also, silent the vast majority of Americans are uh, in the face of an expanding assassination program and a government that now asserts the right to assassinate U.S. citizens without trial. The, the fact that, I forget what the exact numbers were, roughly 70 percent of Americans polled under Obama, including a va the vast majority of self-identified liberal Democrats support drone strikes, is a devastating co commentary. On, on the extent to which people have ceded their conscience uh, to those in power uh, just because they happen to be members of their own party or like the guy in power. I mean, that, that's, that's not participating in a democratic process. That's ceding your conscience to someone else in a really shameful way. Do you think a lot of it is ignorance on the American part? A lot to do with how the media portrays these suspected terrorists. If people know the real story, if they know the way that you're trying to portray them, maybe you know, they won't be so apathetic to these kind of things going on. I, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, you know, the most common uh, refrain that we hear if we criticize uh, targeted strikes. I'm not obsessed with drones, by the way. The most devastating uh, attack in Yemen that killed scores of civilians was a cruise missile attack. It wasn't a drone. So I, I don't, drones, not drones. To me, it's the program itself. Um, but putting that aside, the what you hear a lot of Democrats say is, well, Obama's waging a smarter war. He's waging a more precise war. Uh, he's not subjecting U.S. Uh, soldiers to being killed on the battlefield the way that President Bush did. Um, first of all, the U.S. wouldn't have troops in Yemen uh, if, if Obama wasn't authorizing drone strikes and cruise missile strikes there, no, number one. On a tactical level, that's a nonsensical argument. But second to that, it's just not true. If, if you look at the, the cases where we actually have gone on the ground and investigated, a tremendous number of civilians are being killed. And, and I would say that it's, it's damaging um, our national security uh, by killing so many people around the world uh, whose only crime was being a military-aged male in a certain region of a country. There's going to be blowback. You know, it's, it's, it's as though we haven't learned any of the major lessons of the past 15 years about why people have animosity toward the United States. And, um, you know, I, I, I think we ignore history at our own peril, particularly when it comes to collectively targeting or collectively humiliating or collectively punishing populations. Since the New York Times article has come out and you know things like that, people have started to kind of pay a little bit more attention. Recently, they've renamed the so-called kill list to the disposition, so disposition matrix. Yeah. Yes. Do you, what kind of implications do you think this has? Do you think it's a way of kind of conditioning and trying to make it not sound so serious? Yeah. I mean, I think um, 
<clears throat> you know, the, the, the point of the, the disposition matrix is that people like John Brennan, um, who is sort of the assassin in chief within the you know administration circles. I mean, ultimately the responsibility lies with President Obama, but Brennan really is driving a lot of this policy, and and you know I've heard that from sources within the administration and intelligence community. I think what they're trying to do is to ensure that their le that their legacy of the kill program is going to continue on regardless of who's in power. So, the idea of the disposition matrix is actually creating a system. Uh, that can be used by future presidents, future administrations, to um, you know, essentially create a mathematical equation that will determine who should be killed, who can maybe be uh, arrested, who can be handed over from another government. Um, you know, to me, it's sort of codifying it as a permanent part of the U.S. national security state. That, that's what I think the the point of it is. I don't think it's so much a, a thing of managing. Um, yeah, I don't think it's so much propaganda and using this term in that way to try to manage people's uh, emotions about it. I actually think it's a program to try to uh, ensure that it's going to continue on regardless of who, which party happens to be in power. Um, under Obama, the Espionage Act has certainly been abused. He's used it more than any other administrations come on. How, what effect has this had? Have you seen, it, if, if at all, with journalists, the way that people are reporting and the way that people want to come forward? Well, you know, I mean, the, the, you're, you're interviewing me, me at a time when uh, you know, we're in the midst of learning the extent to which FBI agents were deep into the emails of the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. So if, you know, if the FBI uh, has uh, multi-month access to the private email accounts of General David Petraeus and, uh, and General John Allen, what do you think, what, do you, what kind of access do you think they have for you and me? Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that, uh, that journalists are spied on in this country uh, and communications are regularly intercepted. Um, activists have been targeted not just by the federal government but by state and local law enforcement agencies. Uh, massive major internet service providers, telecommunications companies are completely complicit um, in building up a system where large corporations and the uh, national security state have conspired to make us less free, less uh, able to communicate privately, um, and ultimately I think it, it's, it has a real chilling effect on people. You know, unfortunately, those of us that do work with in sensitive subject areas um, have to constantly be looking at the newest encryption technologies, uh, the newest ways of communicating with one another without government interference. I mean, I, I get stopped every time I come into the U.S. now from out of the country. The last three times I've flown into the country, I've been pulled aside to Area 3 of JFK and interrogated by uh, counterterrorism agents, uh, asking me questions going back to the 1990s about travel and, and other activities I was involved with. So, you know, other journalists are on no-fly lists. Some have had their computers confiscated. You know, the NDAA, uh, you know, that was signed into law by President Obama, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, I think in 10 years we're going to look back and, and people are going to ask themselves, how did we let this happen? Um, we have to hold the line on the, on, on, on the freedoms that we have. Um, and they are constantly under assault from both parties and from large corporations in, in this country. Uh, recently with obviously the internet growing so much, people are kind of moving there and moving away from TV, the mainstream media, things like that are dying, but at the same time we have video games, pro you know, spreading propaganda of war, we have movies, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's propaganda that's constantly being fueled, but at the same time people are, you know, kind of moving away from some aspects of it. What opportunity do you see for, you know, these kind of issues to be in the main conscience of the general public? Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I think it was Gorbachev who used the term warnography. You know, I mean, we 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 have a warnographic state um, in this country where, uh, you know, children are indoctrinated from a very early age to accept mass violence um, as a normal part of entertainment. Um, I think it has everything to do with uh, with crime rates in this country. Uh, I think it has everything to do with an acceptance that uh, organized force is an acceptable way to govern oneself as the leader of the free world. Um, you know, video games, television, our media culture, it all feeds into it. Um, kids in this country grow up uh, essentially pretending that they're drone pilots. And, uh, and lo and behold, they could one day grow up and be a drone pilot, and it's basically like playing, you know, Call of Duty Black Ops. And, and that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty sick and twisted reality. Do you see the independent, uh, the rise of independent media being able to kind of um, battle that, though, battle the propaganda in the main in the mainstream media? You know, I wish I could say to you yes. Um, you know, I mean, I've I've been doing this myself 
for a long time and, and most most of my life in journalism was very, very low paid and without health benefits and doing it because I believed in it and I really, particularly in the, uh, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s was really trying to help build up an independent media movement in this country and around the world. Um, I think it's a daunting task and, um, and I think the verdict is out on how much of an impact any of us can have. Um, you know, there was this old uh, great anarchist named Ammon Hennessy who uh, was a World War I uh, draft resistor and he used to protest in front of the White House and, and people would come up to him and say you know you're not going to change them and he said yeah that's probably true but they're sure as hell not going to change me I, I think media culture will be saved by people that take the mentality that they're, they're going to do it because it's right and um, if we become obsessed with the efficacy of our stories um, we're going to burn out right away you know you, you, at some level it has to be burning in your heart and the young independent journalists that I've met around the world um, that really believe in what they're doing, uh, I think have tremendous uh, opportunity to change the world that, uh, that their kids are going to inherit. So I have a lot of faith in the independent media movement. The other side is a behemoth though, and uh, we have to be humble in our realization of that. So Definitely, yeah. definitely. Do you have any advice that you could give to journalists starting out today? Well, you know, I, I mean, if people have the luxury of not having family commitments um, or, you know, something that would prohibit them from doing it, I, I, I think one of the best ways is to say, you know, I'm not going to do the internship. I'm definitely not going to go to journalism school. Um, I'm going to work summers picking apples, working in a garage, waiting tables, uh, and save up enough money to, to give it a shot for six months of reporting or three months of reporting and sort of work in cycles. I think some of the best journalists I know, in fact, the best journalists I know, never stepped foot in a journalism school. Uh, they were doing something else with their lives um, and, 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 and the fire caught in their heart. So for a lot of young people who, who could afford to do it, to do a job that's not journalism related for a while, save up the money and make a run at it. And I do have the sensation that the public worry about that is not loud enough and consistent enough. I absolutely have that sensation. And um, and you're, you're kind of making me make a mental note to uh, dig into that more. The minor. I, I, I would suggest that you uh, should have a far more responsible father if they're uh, truly concerned about...